Welcome back for the final episode of our three-part TechCrunch Disrupt series about the latest trends out of Silicon Valley. I'm your host, Paul Matsko. Today, I want to talk to you about the way that venture capitalists and startup engineers at TechCrunch Disrupt talked about the state and regulation. The shortest possible summary is less than you might think, but in interesting ways. Let me start by saying how refreshing it was to be surrounded by folks who are fixated on what they can do rather than what they should do. Now, there is a conversation to be had about how blinkered tech culture can be, how they can inadvertently or overtly cause harm because they don't think through the social ramifications of the tech they are developing. For example, when social media engineers invented the quote-unquote infinite scroll, you know, how you can keep flicking up indefinitely on Twitter, Facebook, or Insta, they didn't think about how addictive it would be. Indeed, now the big social media companies are scrambling to undo some of that damage by building in time use monitors and controls. But even Silicon Valley types have to take heed of what regulators are doing. The difference between a successful startup and a failure is as likely to be a bureaucracy as a flawed monetization plan. So there was a panel at TechCrunch, for instance, discussing the difference between how car share companies like Uber and Lyft uh, were received by regulators and scooter rental companies like Lime and Bird more recently have been received, despite having essentially the same it's better to ask forgiveness than permission approach to municipal regulation. They've had very different outcomes. Now, in this case, you know, transportation regulators are coming down hard on scooters because they kind of got pantsed by the ride hailing corporations. But while that's kind of a libertarian friendly way of thinking about regulation, like let's let's break things and if we break enough things, we'll show how we can improve society. None of the people I interviewed or met while at the conference was formally libertarian. There is a general ethos uh, of annoyance there at, at regulators who won't let them do cool tech stuff, but it's too inchoate to really be considered proto-libertarian in any kind of systematic way. But one thing is very clear from spending time at TechCrunch, and that's that the U.S. is being bypassed um, by other countries, in part because of the difficulty and the increasing difficulty of doing innovative work without falling afoul of local, state, and federal regulators. One of the exhibitors on Startup Alley was a company named Wingly, which is essentially applying the Airbnb business model to private planes. So let's say you own a half a million dollar private plane, should we all be so lucky, and regularly hop over the English Channel with it. Uh, you know, it might be faster than taking the train or flying commercial, or maybe you just like flying. You love seeing the you know cliffs of Dover. But it's expensive to own and operate a plane, and jet fuel ain't cheap. So rather than flying alone, the idea of Wingly is that you would use their app to offer one or two of, of your seats in your plane for passengers, who would then help you defray the cost of fuel. It's a win-win. Your maintenance cost, your operating cost is lower, and the passenger gets the convenience and luxury of a private plane ride. That sounds great, right? So what does regulation have to do with this story? Wingly is a French company. Aviation, despite the reputation of regulation on the continent versus the U.S., aviation is actually significantly less regulated in much of Europe than in the U.S. By contrast, a U.S. company called FlightNow that essentially wanted to do the same thing was just shut down this year by the FAA, which ruled that defraying fuel costs made FlightNow pilots commercial rather than private pilots. And thus, they would be subject to all the training requirements, all the labor organization rules that apply to commercial piloting. Why did they do that? Well, part of it's lobbying from pilot unions. They don't like the competition. But also because if there's one thing that bureaucracies abhor, it's risk, risk of any kind. They don't want passengers taking the risks involved in flying on a private plane, which are real. You are more likely to die in a crash on a private plane than you are on a commercial flight. At the same time, that risk, while it's larger, is not as large as dying in a car crash one mile from your home. So its risk is always relative, but the FAA has essentially a zero tolerance policy towards risk when it comes to new innovative business models. Now, at the end of the day, flight sharing is a relatively niche consumer audience. We're essentially making access to private plane rides accessible to the upper middle class and not just the upper class. 
and it's an incremental upgrade. But on the other hand, there is a developing niche that falls under transportation regulation that has the potential to transform the lives of everyone, regardless of income or ownership. I'm talking here of autonomous vehicles, and they're coming very, very soon. I mean, in fact, depending on what you count, they're already here in the sense that most of us, if we buy a new car or buying a car that parks itself, it does its own cruise control. It has emergency braking if we, if we can't stop quickly enough on our own. And features like that are becoming the new standard for vehicles. That's what's called level two automation on a level five scale. Uh, they're all techs that assist a human driver who's still responsible to keep their hands on the wheel and their eyes looking out the windows at all time. But levels three to five all involve increasing levels of driver-free automation, with level five being a car that has no steering wheel at all. Our next interview is with a car, autonomous car company called Byton, which is developing a level three car with hopes for a level four car in the near future. Listen in. I'm here with Florian Bauer, who's the head of product management for uh, in a car manufacturer called Byton. Uh, they do some autonomous vehicles. It's an electric vehicle. It's designed to be shared. We're going to talk a little bit about more of that together. But thanks for coming on with me, Florian. I appreciate it. Sure. Thanks for having me. So to kick us off, um, I should mention that Byton is literally around the neck of every attendee of TechCrunch Disrupt. They, they're on our lanyards uh, for our... Uh, for our name tags. Um, I hadn't heard of Byton until this conference. Uh, so tell me a little bit about the company. When our, our listeners hear Byton, they're thinking probably, or hear, think of car company sponsoring major tech conference. They're probably not at this point thinking about Byton. So tell me why they should be aware of Byton. All right. So Byton is a company uh, that was founded about uh, a little bit more than two years ago. Um, it was founded in Hong Kong and um, won investor had an idea and started uh, recruiting people for about one or two years until he found the perfect team from different spaces uh, to actually pull this off, right? Um, so we're a bunch of ex-BMW people who worked on the BMW i uh, mm. sub-brand. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of people from who, who used to work at Tesla before. Uh, we combined this knowledge with the uh, tech knowledge from other companies, from Apple or Google, and uh, you name the company, and we probably have an ex-employee uh, um, <laughs> yeah. in our company yeah. now. It's good. So uh, we started off very small with uh, just an idea on a, a blank sheet of paper. We understood that the future is going to be electric, uh, so it had to be an electric car, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that was no question. Um, the future is going to be connected. That's what we knew. So we had to do something to leverage technology to actually connect uh things to things right and also uh, develop a car as a device so as one additional smart device in your ecosystems of devices that you just add uh, to your other devices mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and then of course um, we had to uh, tackle the question of autonomous cars we all know the future is going to be somewhat autonomous sure. so of course we want to play in that field as well and we need to consider the changing um customer habits of maybe not even owning a car in the future anymore, mm, but uh, mm -hmm. using it on demand in a shared uh, vehicle. So we also uh, tackle that space a little bit. And the idea was from a blank sheet of paper to keep all these things in mind and uh, design a vehicle architecture that is scalable to multiple products and future-proof uh, for mm. the next 10 years. So you don't necessarily need to be at uh, the kind of maximum future capability in any of those regards you just have to be you, you you're, but you need to build in build in the capacity to get there in the future yeah. so like with the self-driving bit my understanding is the prototype that's out on display here on the floor in the exhibition hall is like level three um exactly. autonomous yeah so um Basically, this, these things come step by step. The first yeah. car will be super focused on the user experience, on the uh, new way to interact with a car. We have a 49-inch screen built in uh, to the dashboard. It's so quite the, impressive. I'll say that uh, as someone who sat in the car. It's yeah, all it's, it surrounds you. It's probably going to be the biggest screen you see on the market. And yeah. the difference is we're not just talking about it. We're actually doing it yeah. and uh, developing it. And uh, we're adding a... a a driver display that we call driver tablet that is a touch screen uh, right in the middle of the steering wheel um, to sort of prepare for uh, use cases that will be eventually enabled 
by autonomous uh, driving or by more and more situations in which you can give control to the vehicle. Yeah. Right. Um, so the goal is to to develop everything uh, with the future in mind. So we're not dependent on autonomous driving. You can still drive the car uh, yourself. Right, it right. still has a steering wheel because uh, the risk would just be too high that in, at some point it's a legal issue and you can't offer the car because it doesn't right, have a steering right. wheel. Right. Um, the screen uh, offers you endless opportunities for services uh, based on your personal profile that you bring to the car. Uh, it recognizes you with a facial recognition camera. It knows mm. exactly what seat you're taking hmm. to bring your content onto your screen or your area of the screen that is uh, most convenient to you. Which as both of us as parents of young children will appreciate. Uh, exactly. You, know, you can a, just send something <laughs> to the back and yeah. uh, make sure they are... Um, they're happy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Number one priority for every parent driving. Or quiet. <laughs> or quiet. One of the two. Right. Um, ideally both. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so advanced levels of autonomous driving will enable more and more use cases uh, for these for the content on these screens. Um, and the goal is that the user interface will just grow with these use cases and not have to be rethought uh, after after level four and level five will come. So the first car, as you mentioned, will have level three capabilities. So which means high, highway pilot and okay. uh, other individual situations in which the car will be able to uh, take over. So remote parking and, and all of these features that that add convenience to your daily life. Yeah. But it's not like this on and off switch that level four is, um, let's say it's either completely autonomous or not. It's more situation adequate, right? Um, also in line with the legal uh, requirements that you have to fulfill in all the markets. Then the second car, uh, we're developing on the same platform, by the way, uh, is equipped with uh, level four technology. We're partnering with a company called Aurora in this space. Okay. So um, Aurora was founded uh, by let's say, the head of uh, Google's activities in the self-driving space, teaming up uh, with uh, the person at Tesla and the person at Uber uh, who developed uh, autonomous driving technology there, and uh, they created their own company. And uh, they provide the hardware and the algorithm, and we act as the vehicle integration uh, mm -hmm. company for them to, to be able um, to hand-in-hand be quick to market um, because one thing is the system and another thing is the application on each car that is different right, right. because every car has different uh, geometries and uh, just you know d d different uh, is engineered differently so the same system might work differently or needs to be adjusted for every car and we need to bring some of that integration knowledge to this partnership um, to to get some traction and, and speed to to the development no that makes sense um so that there we have the um, user display, we have the software of the car, which I imagine again you can push updates remotely, exactly. wirelessly, or, or which is something yes. that other companies are doing as well. Um, now, is there any concern with uh, having a big dashboard display like that? I, um, I know this again isn't unique to Byton, but is there concern about you know viewer attention that yes. folks looking at their screens Definitely. rather than how, how is there a system for yeah. discouraging that? So. Um, the the first thing I can say there is that the the screen is not impacting your field of vision. That was uh, the number one importance for us in the design of the car. So we moved the dashboard as low as possible to move the screen down as low as possible. So the top of the screen is actually at the same height as your windshield wipers. So it's not impacting your field of vision. And then when it comes to driver distraction, of course we will not be able to allow. Uh, moving images uh, in a driving situation at first. Uh, we're looking at different uh, opportunities to um, sort of uh, to, to, to put additional coding on the screen, for example, to uh, enable the passenger to uh, enjoy some of the uh, video content while a driver is still driving. Um, but again, the, uh, the hardware setup is ready for autonomous driving. Autonomous driving might not keep up the pace, right? But right, uh, right. when it's there, the car is already perfectly designed for that. And uh, the, you, you still have a lot of content that you can uh, display on, on that 49-inch uh, screen uh, without being uh, too distracting. The, the main goal should be to reduce the number of inputs you have to give to the system. So the more you share with the vehicle, the more data, yeah. the more it knows about you and the more it can anticipate 
what you want to do next. So we can prompt you messages, and you just have to say yes or no. Right, right, Either right. using a hand gesture with in the gesture control uh, yep. uh, cameras, or uh, in your driver tablet, just have a touch button and say yes or no, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, the more you, you use the car, and the more the car learns about you, the, the better these suggestions will get. So actually, in terms of the usage of the car, we're already, uh, uh, let's say, we're already quite certain that it will be more intuitive and less distracting than finding a button somewhere hidden in some right. submenu or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but then when it comes to content, of course, we're very careful as to which functions and features and services and products we actually enable yeah. in a driving situation and which ones do we actually disable when the car is driving and only allow in, in a heavy traffic situation or uh, when you're... Uh, when you're having a quick uh, a charging stop, right? Uh, right and you right. can charge the car uh, up to 80% in about 30 minutes. That's oh, nice. uh, enough right. time to watch an episode of your favorite Netflix show, for example, right? right. Yeah. Um, and it's much more convenient than using your uh, tiny little uh, iPhone screen or, or uh, smartphone screen, yeah. not to mention any brands. Right? But it's smart enough to know that it's you're, you're parked, <laughs> so you're exactly. not... There's no, there's no danger to the... Yeah, right, 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 yeah. Um, is there... Um, I mean, if there's facial recognition software and ca driver cameras, um, can it can it tell if you're you know, falling asleep? Does yes. it track eye movement yeah. and eyelids? So, and so that's called a driver monitoring system. Yeah. Um, we need that for certain um, functions in autonomous driving um, that still require uh, the driver's attention legally. Yeah. Right. Um, so we we have to track your attention, and um, we're we're further developing new functions and features around that topic to also contextually be able to display some information on the screen or even um, get around today's legislation in the future potentially, right? Yeah. For example, imagine you could have the passenger watch a movie and keep track of the driver's attention. If the driver looks at the movie content, you just uh, uh, warn him to not do it anymore or you just turn it off, right? Yeah. So, so we're playing a lot we're playing around a lot with these, uh, let's say, use cases that might enable more features without being uh, yeah. d uh, dangerous, right? Um, safety is the number one concern, and of course, we want to comply with all the legal requirements in all markets. Um, but we also want to help shape legislation uh, in the future to make sure that legislation will keep up with uh, the, all the technology development in this uh, highly regulated autonomous uh, automotive space. Uh, that slows down uh, innovation uh, a lot. Yeah, uh, this we'll, we'll get to the kind of regulatory angle here. I think in a, in a minute. But first, um, so we've talked, we've talked electric, we've talked AV, we've talked about the screens, we've talked about the car a bit. Uh, how are you looking to build uh, car sharing into you know into into Byton now? Yeah. Uh, so the the car is potentially. A preferred solution for an, for an Uber driver or, or a Didi driver in China or a Lyft driver, right? Uh, because um, you can make every Byton, or you could turn every Byton into your Byton by just bringing your face, right? So, uh, so it doesn't yeah. matter if it's my car or your car. You sit in your seat, whatever it is, the driver's seat or the rear right seat, right? And you bring all your content there. Ah, so, cool. yeah. So, um, it could potentially be a preferred choice for a user to to take me as an Uber driver with a Byton car um, uh, because you can be more productive, you can be entertained, you can you can continue whatever you are doing outside of the car, in it the car. It knows well. that you're in season two of whatever. And exactly. Th the, the third episode kicks on for you while, you're, while your exactly. Uber driver's tearing you around. Or, yeah. or <laughs> we have, you know, we have this selfie camera there so you could, you could record your uh, important presentation that you're about to have and play it back to you and, yeah. you know, like there's so many different use yeah, cases cool. that yeah. make you be more productive or uh, whatever you require in that certain situation and um, we treat every passenger uh, as relevant as the driver okay um, so so the experience on every seat is the same and this is also uh, one aspect that prepares us for the you know shared bit of mobility yeah is uh, even in a in a car with uh, three strangers uh, you would still have your own zone and your own seat with your content and uh, and uh, basically make it your car and you're not uh, sort of you're sharing it, but you still have your own space, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, we're 
already thinking about the second and the third car, and we have a lot more to share uh, in the in the next twelve months. Um, oh, what's the so? What's the time frame for? Like, I see the prototype out here from the website. I can. There's another model, another variant yeah, for exactly. like 2022. Yeah. But, so but this one on the floor out here, when when are you expecting that to be in so, production? So we're uh, kicking off production end of next year uh, uh, for the China market first. And mm. then six months later, we'll bring it to the U.S. So by mid-2020, you'll be able to get it here. And another three, four months later, we'll bring it to Europe as well. And then 18 months after the start of production of the first car, we'll release... Our second car, which is a sedan concept, we call it K-Byte, and the SUV is M-Byte. Um, also priced uh, very similarly um, and derived from the same platform. Now, when you say priced similarly, uh, where, sim- where yeah, is the slotting exactly, in? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's still early stage. Uh, we, we can't really uh, share the details for the sure. second car, but uh, our aim is to be an approachable brand, to not start high-end and then slowly move down the ladder we want to go where the volume is sure um, also to have uh, you know an interesting business case for our investors because it's such a heavy upfront investment to develop a car you would like it to be scalable and uh, you know applicable to multiple different products and not just yeah. one and um, that's what we're doing and then another um, about one and a half two years later we'll bring the third car out on, on the same platform again okay yeah and we're already thinking about a second platform uh, which is very early stage right now but uh, as you can see the the stuff that we're showing here is already old for us right uh, yeah, there yeah. are very long development cycles in the automotive sure. industry so you have to think ahead sure. yeah. and you have to match it with the shorter and faster developing uh, cycles in tech companies mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. so we have we have the unique challenge to uh, uh, to synchronize the mindset between the people with a tech background and the people with an uh, automotive background, both have their pros and cons. Right. Um, and we're only successful if we uh, listen to all of them and take the best out of uh, each and everyone's experience. Well, it's a reminder, like with uh, you know, a, a, with a Byton competitor with uh, Tesla, they ran into some some of that uh, with their uh, production line, where there was the you know, Elon Musk brought that tech sector mindset, yeah. which is why can't we have a quick product cycle and we just disrupt you know new things new ideas layer layer them on whereas the traditional car production line is whoa you need you need precision you need um a level of you know everything has to be carefully fought through in advance because if anything in the the product supply chain or on the production line goes just a little bit off yeah everything can just you know, fall apart. Fall yeah. apart really quickly. Exactly. And, and so they, they had issues putting those two pieces exactly. together. Exactly. You have to find the right balance. And, and yeah. this is key. And uh, I mean, what other players in the industry have done is uh, remarkable in this short time. And um, it had it opened up a lot of opportunities for the new players. Um, but I think um, there's, I mean, a, lo- a strong debate about strong leaders who are very influential um, as opposed to um, maybe you know the, listening to to the experts to, um, to 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 make the best possible product, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and we're trying to really uh, set a freeze date to a th- to to a certain hardware component that needs a freeze date, and then we don't talk about it anymore, right? right? Uh, right we don't right, go, right. we don't walk in uh, a week later and say, "Oh, I changed my mind," right? And uh, this is one thing. And the second thing is we don't do innovation for the innovation sake we don't do crazy uh, door concepts or anything uh, that might potentially give you problems with uh, you know water leakage and, and, and things like that yeah we we use all of that knowledge from the um, from the more boring aut- automotive uh, world um, and then we focus our attention on where the faster cycles actually allow us to be innovative yeah. and to keep the product fresh and this is connectivity and this is uh, the user experience yeah. Uh, that is much more valued by the consumer than uh, an incremental uh, tenth of a second acceleration improvement or uh, yeah. a yeah. unique door concept that only you have only invented. Yeah. Or, uh, so, so we're taking a lot of off-the-shelf components that have proven to be Smart. safe and yeah. uh, also uh, accepted in the market. Yeah, you have and a, then we there's innovate. a supply chain for it. It's all, exactly. right. it's all yep. there yep. and uh, it's all optimized in terms of cost so that we can... Uh, uh, position the car at an accessible price point too nice. so yeah. uh, we can't go too crazy but we want to go crazy where uh, the customer expects us to Yeah, and uh, I think you can see a lot of this here uh, in our first uh, M-Byte yeah. concept 
Yeah, no, it's it's a it's an impressive prototype. So, I mean, I look forward to seeing it on the on the roads or on the on the lots uh, come 2020. Um, one more thing I was going to ask about during a panel yesterday, uh, I think it was a robotics panel on the main stage. The they ended the session by asking, uh, and make sure I get the criteria criteria right here. At what point do you think? Uh, level five vehicles, so level five automation, like full, no, no hands on, wheel, no yeah. steering wheel, nothing, will be at least ten percent of the vehicles, consumer vehicles on the road. And the panelists ranged anywhere from ten years at the lower limit to thirty years at the upper limit. But notably, two of them mentioned ten year, ten to fifteen years, but in China first. Um, and yeah. now, Biden has a has some China roots. You're coming exactly. out with the first car in China first. Uh, you know, from from your perspective, why does coming out in China first make a lot of sense? What role does China play in the AV space more generally? Um, and then, do you think that those are are uh, what, what would your estimate be or answer okay. to that question? Okay, there's a lot of yeah, lots of lots going on there. Different yeah. elements in this question. So, uh, first of all, um, the electric vehicle market in China is uh, twice the size of the electric vehicle market in the U.S. and Europe combined. So wow. This yeah. is why we have to absolutely be uh, quick to market there to capture some of that market share before it takes off without us. Right? Yeah, um, sure. Of course, the U.S. is a very important market too. So we don't want to have too much time in between. But then, uh, uh, shifting to autonomous driving. Um, I think the uh, when when China and the Chinese government is committed to something, they actually do everything to achieve that target. They did it with uh, electric vehicles. They took it very seriously. They started subsidizing a lot of uh, companies, and in the beginning, um, they uh, they were only very cheap players popping out. But yeah. now we have more and more uh, technology focused companies as our competitors out of China already yeah, yeah. Um, that will. Uh, first hit uh, the Chinese market and some of them are also planning to go global. Um, I think um, China has understood that uh, you can only survive as a, a global company, so you have to go where the talent is. We're going to Germany for our vehicle design because the design infrastructure is best in Central Europe. We're going for tech, tech development and uh, uh, serial development of our first car um, to the Bay Area because that's where you find the best people for that space. Uh, and we're going for uh, to China for manufacturing because that's where you get the best opportunities and the talent to actually get the best quality in production. Uh, my previous company, BMW, has the most advanced factory in China yeah. uh, and not in Germany. Uh, uh, yeah, and yeah. Um, so you have to go where the talent is. And and China is very open to uh, the collaboration and appreciative of the global talent that uh, comes in. And I think this is a major difference to uh, my home country, Germany, but also to what I see here in the U.S., is that uh, other areas in the world are, are getting more and more protective of what they have while China is opening up more hmm. and hmm. at the same time gaining speed. And yeah. um, I think if you have that mentality of not being able to do the stuff alone, you have to partner with the best. And, yeah. and it doesn't matter whether they're in Scandinavia, whether they're in... Uh, Antarctica or in the Bay Area or in China, right? Yeah, um, you yeah. just have to go there and uh, convince the best people to work with you and um, collaborate on the best possible solution for the consumer. So with consumer relevance, right? Not just yeah. for the technology's sake. And I think uh, that's best understood in China right now. And of course, uh, you have 1.3, 1.4 billion uh, customers potentially. Market. So yeah. it's a huge market in <laughs> itself. Um, so there's a lot of money for uh, subsidizing and incentivizing companies to build up their uh, R&D or production facilities in, uh, in cities that have been super small in the, in, yeah. in the past 100 years and now are growing at a uh, rapid pace, overtaking major European cities already in, in two, three years' time. Yeah. Um, and and they, gen they already start building cities with full connectivity of... You know, everything is connected, like Internet of Things and stuff. Right. Uh, so they're building cities from they're, scratch. They're building with that the infrastructure, in there. yes, yeah. ready for autonomous driving. And this is why you'll see the autonomous driving space will grow in these areas mm. with these cities. And um, yeah. I think that's the unique bit about China. China is still very hungry. Uh, you walk around in the Bay Area, everyone has already collected uh, uh, enough <laughs> stock options. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it's it's the general vibe that you feel in yeah. the Bay Area. There's contentment. 
in exactly sense, and yeah. people people um, are more fo more focused on their uh, work life balance uh, here mm -hmm. um, and then you go to China and people might not have the skill in every uh, discipline yet but they're hungry yeah and they're hard working and they're committed and they're listening yeah and they're yeah. Uh, appreciative of as I said of uh, you know the expert knowledge that you bring they're no longer here to copy they're now here to really think about solving real problems and how to bring an existing product or an existing service to the next level and I think uh, it's super enjoyable to work um, in this global setup yeah with the best people from anywhere in the world and uh Yeah, I hope I answered. Some no, yeah, of the I think I think yeah, all three of them. I threw a bunch at you all at the same time. Well, and I think one of your uh, one of your fellow represent Biden representatives mentioned that there were some 400 plus AV companies or you know adjacent AV adjacent companies operating in China right now. I mean, it's the single biggest locus of AV development. I mean, you know, so it's kind of truly remarkable what's going on over there. Um, there was actually a really good. We did an episode for Building Tomorrow for this podcast about the transformation of China and the ways in which the country is leapfrogging the U.S. I mean, the tech adoption rates on everything from digital payment systems to, you know, it, it's just drone deliveries. Exactly. They, don't have, it. Uh, they didn't have PCs for a long time, but now they uh, do mobile payments uh, in, in, you know, every, uh, let's say, segment of the society, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. It's truly remarkable. Well... Uh, Florian, thank you so much for taking the time oh, to you. talk to me. And uh, I think our listeners will understand a lot more about uh, what Byton's doing and a little more about the AV space. So okay. thanks for your time. And please tell your user or listeners to download the Byton app. Okay. It's free. And yeah. they can bring uh, our M-Byte concept into their living room if they have a dual camera phone. Because we have an augmented reality feature on our app. Um, And if you want, you can already sign up uh, and get more information, get in invitations for our upcoming events uh, in your area, and uh, stay tuned. Great. Thank you so much. As you listen to this interview, you might have been thinking of Episode 9 of Building Tomorrow, Is China Beating the U.S. at Innovation? We recorded that episode prior to TechCrunch, but everything I saw at this conference confirmed that, yes, indeed, China is in pole position to be the site of the next autonomous vehicle-style Silicon Valley. Now, even though there's always the chance that the authoritarian central government could shoot itself in its economic foot, tech startups that do have the favor of the Communist Party on their side can innovate mostly free from regulation. They don't have to deal with the welter of regulatory bodies that a startup has to in the United States, from the San Francisco City Council deciding they don't like scooters or the Federal Aeronautics Administration deciding they don't like flight sharing. And that's it for this week. In fact, that's it for our TechCrunch Disrupt series of episodes. Thank you for listening. And until next week, be well. Building Tomorrow is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy our show, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn about Building Tomorrow or to discover other great podcasts, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.